Hello, my name is Kemper Donovan. I am the co-host of the All About Agatha podcast. You'll be meeting my co-host Catherine Brobeck in just a moment for the upcoming interview we did as part of the International Agatha Christie Festival at Home Edition. For those who haven't listened to the podcast, I should explain that we, like you, are devotees of Christie, so much so that we have spent the last four years and counting uh, devoted to a close study and celebration of Christie's texts. We're even trying to systematically rank all 66 of Christie's novels, which as you can imagine is uh, quite an involved endeavor, but one that we deeply enjoy and cherish. If you'd like to check us out, you can go to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever you may listen to podcasts and put All About Agatha in the search field. Our nifty little Art Deco inspired logo should pop right up. And now let's begin the interview. So uh, we are so pleased to have internationally best-selling crime novelist Sophie Hanna with us today. Sophie, as most of you probably know, has been filling some very big shoes over the last five years, having created four original Poirot novels to date. Those would be, just so we know what we're talking about here, I'm going to run through them at the top of our interview. Uh, the Monogram Murders, published in 2015. Closed Casket, published in 2016. The Mystery of Three Quarters, published in 2018. And The Killings at Kingfisher Hill, which was just published a few weeks ago in August of 2020. So first of all, congrats, Sophie, on the, the recent uh, publication and welcome. Thank you. This is very exciting. I'm really... Uh... This is a, we've chatted before, but we've never chatted on Zoom before. So <laughs> the, I, it makes it makes life just far more thrilling. I think we've all found out these last few months, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we, we all have Zoom addled lives these days. So, uh, <laughs> this is this is in keeping with the way of the world at the moment. Um, so I, I guess just to start off, uh, I think you know, obviously these Poirot continuation novels were all done with the blessing of the Christie estate. So I, we should probably start with the most obvious question here, which is how exactly did you pull off this coup of writing gig, Sophie? Well, lots of people probably already know this story, uh, but I will tell it again, just in case anyone doesn't know. Please. It came about completely by lucky chance. My agent was at a meeting at HarperCollins in, in London, and the meeting was nothing to do with me or Agatha Christie. It was a completely different meeting. But he remembered that HarperCollins published Agatha Christie and he knew that I was a big fan. And so he just suggested it without having mentioned it to me ever. He just suggested to HarperCollins, why don't you get my author, Sophie Hannah, who's a big Agatha Christie fan, to write some kind of new Christie brand novel? Uh, and he was told, oh, there's no way the family would would want that to happen but then the very next day the editor who had said no who is now my Poirot editor David Braun um, he had a meeting with the Christie family and at that meeting Matthew Pritchard said Matthew is uh, Agatha's grandson and he at the time was the chairman of Agatha Christie Limited and he said this is going to surprise you but we the family have started to think that we might want a continuation novel at which point David, the HarperCollins editor, said, huh, that's a strange coincidence. I had this agent in my office yesterday who thinks he might have the perfect author for that very job. And so a meeting was arranged and it all took off from there. But it was purely that lucky chance of my agent having that idea and saying something about it in that meeting uh, that made it all happen. So if that hadn't happened, there may well have been, there probably would have been, new Poirot novels, but it's very unlikely that I would have been the person writing them. Well, it was clearly meant to be. <laughs> I mean, also good agenting, right? To just like express your client's general interest. I mean, how lucky, how lucky is that to at least have somebody representing you who knows you well enough to be able to do that? Yeah, my agent is, a, he's amazing. He's brilliant, but he is a real maverick. He's a bit like if you've watched House, you know, the medical mystery drama with Hugh Laurie. My agent is like Dr. House, but literally thereof. Uh, so he's, he's brilliant and he's a genius and he has these inspired ideas. 
but he's also very unconventional. So the unconventional part was suggesting it without first mentioning it to me because <laughs> I had no idea he was making this suggestion. So when I got a phone call from him that night and he said, oh, I suggested this to Harper Collins," and they said, no way, the family would never want anything like that to happen. At that point, I was a bit annoyed that he'd made this suggestion without checking with me. <laughs> I thought, you know, I thought, great, completely out of the blue, he's created an opportunity for me to be rejected for something that I would never have thought to apply for in the first place. Um, and then the next day he rang up and said, well, the Christie family want to meet you because he'd heard back from David that, in fact, the Christie family did want to think about a new book. That's fantastic. Um, well, I, I also think it'll just for anyone who's not familiar with the novels, I think it's also um, helpful just to establish um, where they fall and where they fit into the Poirot chronology, because you made a very deliberate and I think very clever decision as to the timing of, of these novels. So I just wanted uh, uh, to see if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we, we decided that we certainly didn't want to do anything like bring Poirot back to life after Agatha had um, killed him. <laughs> Not to put a fine point on it in curtain. Um, right. We didn't want to bring back to life, but we also didn't want to do something like a prequel because The Mysterious Affair at Styles is well known as Poirot's first iconic outing. Uh, so David, my editor, pointed out that there were four years between 1928 and 1932, during which Agatha did not write a Poirot novel. And so we decided there and then that mine would be slotted in there. I love wow. that. It, it's such a, you know, uh, fruitful time in Poirot's career, obviously. He's still well, It couldn't have been more perfect from my and point of view. That's the sort of- He conveniently also lose Hastings during that time, you know? He's off gallivanting in Argentina, right? So- Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So actually, like, for, again, for the readers, or well, for the viewers of this who maybe don't know, I think that it would be really helpful also to talk about how losing Hastings allowed you a different kind of entry point into Poirot, because you have your own character in these four books, and I think that's useful to talk about as a way into these, and how they, how he serves as a sort of different kind of audience surrogate for um, the reader, you know, in their interactions with Poirot. Yeah, well, I, I, as soon as I knew I was going to be writing a new Poirot novel, I needed to think about, did I want it to be written in the third person or in the first person? Now, Agatha Christie wrote Poirot novels in both. Mm -hmm. There are some in the third person. There are some in the first person from Hastings' point of view, uh, which meant that Agatha Christie's writing style is Hastings' voice. And so I didn't want to try and do Hastings and get it wrong. And I knew that my writing style would inevitably be different from Agatha's. So I thought, given that I am going to be a new person writing about Agatha Christie's Poirot, it would actually be brilliant if I could invent a, a new narrator and a new sidekick for Poirot. Because I, I did want to use the genius detective with trusty sidekick trope. Uh, so I invented Inspector Catchpool, Scotland Yard policeman, uh, and he is the narrator of all four of my Poirot novels, and he tells the stories in the first person. And I just thought that was a sensible and kind of authentic feeling way of mirroring the, the fact that I'm a new person writing slash talking about Poirot, and Catchpool, who is my creation, is also a new person writing and talking about Poirot. So if readers were to read my Poirot novels and think, huh, they're similar to Agatha Christie's in that they contain Poirot and a murder mystery, but they're also different in a way. They, you know, the, the voice is maybe a bit different. Then there's a sensible reason explaining that because it's a new narrator. Absolutely. That makes a tremendous amount of sense. What was the decision to make um, him Scotland Yard? What, I guess, to phrase it a different way, Hastings and Poirot are both sort of well, at some level, the consummate insiders, right? They have all these connections to Scotland Yard, they have Inspector Jap, etc. They're still outsiders. Whereas 
adding a Scotland Yard inspector as the sort of sidekick to Poirot is kind of an interesting new dynamic because you have an insider than actually inside of the legal system. And I sort of wondered a little bit if you could speak to that and how that, um, um, it, you know, it certainly comes up in a new book, uh, the fact that yeah. he is actually a policeman, you know, versus operating outside of the system. And so I think that's an interesting choice. And I wanted to know a little bit about that. Well, it's interesting because until you asked me that question, I don't think I've ever really focused on why I did that. When I, when I knew that I wanted to invent a new narrator and sidekick, the thing I did focus on was that I wanted it to be somebody who, while they were never going to be as clever and brilliant as Poirot, I did want the new sidekick to be somebody who was quite clever, and if not brilliant, then at least with potential to improve his detective skills because I've always sort of loved the fact that in in the Hastings Poirot novels Hastings despite close proximity to Poirot over and over again he never sort of I mean I, I'm not criticizing him but he never takes the opportunity to think I could learn from Poirot and become a better murder solver uh, which is kind of a, not that he should do that, but it's kind of a missed opportunity. So I wanted to have a sidekick for Poirot who would feel the way I would if I were working with Poirot, like who would start out thinking, I'm a clever person who can achieve things, but then through working with Poirot, get to see over and over again that they're just not as good as Poirot and try and learn from Poirot. And I wanted... I wanted also to be able to use that in my characterization of Poirot because I, I thought, you know, he, he values so highly clear thought and deductive reasoning and order and method. And I thought, you know, there'd be nothing he would love more than to have a sort of somebody who, who he could be a mentor for. And so I loved the idea of Catchpool getting gradually better and better and sort of being as it were trained by Poirot so that was what I remember thinking about and focusing on but I think actually the reason I wanted him to be Scotland Yard which it just didn't even feel like a decision it was just like he was always going to be that but I think the reason that appeals to me is that I often notice that somebody whose job it isn't to do a particular thing is very often much better at doing that thing than the person whose job it is. I just keep, like, all throughout my life, I've noticed that. I'll sort of think, oh, it's so-and-so's job to do that. And yet, look how terribly they're doing it. Whereas, actually, that person whose job it isn't is so much better at doing that thing. Wait, are you, are you saying that you've had a job or been in an office at any point, Sophie? <laughs> Me? No, 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 I'm just saying in general, I think everybody has that experience of being in yeah. some sort of, you know, whether or not it's an academic environment or, you know. No, no, I mean, I've had loads of jobs and actually sometimes I've had jobs where I haven't been very good at them and someone else would have been better. And equally often I've been in situations where something isn't my job, the person whose job it is, is doing it appallingly and I go in and do it instead, even though it's not my job and I do it brilliantly. So I just notice in all kinds of settings that if you adopt the attitude of let the person whose job it is do the thing, then the thing often does not get done as well. And so I just like that conceit of Catchpool being, as it were, officially the one mm -hmm. who should be solving murders, but actually Poirot is the one who really can. As I'm sure Inspector Jap has attested to many a person over time, you know, even if not yeah. completely. <laughs> it's actually, I mean, this is probably too much of a tangent, but it's actually one of the things I teach in my dream author coaching program for writers, because often I get writers who, who I'm coaching and they say to me, well, I, I feel as if this, that and the other should be happening in relation to my book that's about to be published. And it doesn't seem to be happening. And the person whose job it is to make it happen, they're not making, making it happen. And I always say, your mistake is in assuming that it's their job. Just because they've got some job title 
if you could make it happen, then decide it's your job. Even if you're not getting paid for it, if you can do the thing better than the person who should be doing the thing, then start doing the thing. Right. If you want it done. Yeah. If it's important. If it's done. Done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, that, that is good advice. It's funny. I think that conversation partially answered my next question, which was about the catch pool Poirot relationship, or even just more broadly, I think the tone of the novels, which I believe has shifted a, a little bit and you, you may disagree with me, but my, my perception was that um, especially in monogram murders, comparing monogram murders to the killings at Kingfisher Hill, there's a lightness to Catchpool, both in terms of his relationship with Poirot, which has really deepened by the fourth novel. I mean, they have a rapport, right? Um, yeah. They, they have a shtick, <laughs> you, you could say. They know each other really well by that point. And also, Catchpool makes a number of wry asides to the reader about his mother, for example, in, in Killings at Kingfisher Hill. And comparing that to the rather traumatic flashbacks that were happening in Monogram Murders, I was struck when I was reading this last novel, Kingfisher Hill, at the relative lightness in tone, the fact that it had lightened a bit over time. And I wonder if that is because this mentor-mentee relationship has kind of flourished and maybe that's that's done something to catch pool as as a character, uh, I'm not sure. I was curious if you agreed with with that readerly observation and and what you made of that. Uh, yeah, I do agree. I think there are several things going on. So the first thing to say is that in the monogram murders, the precise way in which the murderer arranged the dead bodies tr kind of triggered yeah. a trauma that Catchpool had. Now it was. Um, quite interesting because after the monogram murders was published and obviously no one else had read the other three because I hadn't written them yet <laughs> but lots of people read the monogram murders and, and wrote to me and said how can Catchpool be a Scotland Yard murder detective when he's traumatized by murder how can this work this is the wrong career path that he has chosen <laughs> and I wrote back to many people saying he isn't traumatized by murder it's this particular murder and the fact that the bodies were laid out in a particular way and the fact that it was his first encounter with a murderer that was thinking in a cryptic and almost like art director way. Mm. All the murders Catchpole had dealt with before were just normal murders, which as we know in real life murders are not cryptic and intriguing and devised by cunning ingenious types. So it was the fact of him suddenly feeling that he was in way above his head because someone very imaginative had obviously committed this murder. Plus Poirot is involved and he can see that Poirot's skills are so much greater than his own and the layout of the bodies is triggering him. So in the monogram murders, Catchpool is a neurotic mess basically yes. and he's he's now i i'm not saying i'm not dissing him i still love him as a character in the monogram murders because in real life we often are a neurotic mess and we're still lovable right so it's fine that he's a neurotic mess in the monogram murders but but he is one um and really the only sort of glimmer of his potential to be a good detective in the monogram murders is quite late on he comes up with one part of the solution. Uh, there's a particular scene, I won't spoiler it obviously, but there's a particular scene where he and Poirot are in the village and he says, he, he works out one thing and Poirot then uses that as the basis to work out everything else. So that's meant to be a little sign for the reader that Catchpool has potential. Then in Closed Casket, the second book, Catchpool is still, he's, he's not quite as neurotic as in the monogram murders, but he's still not sure how he feels about the fact that his new mate is much better at his job than he is. And he's a bit prickly on occasion. And, you know, when he meets Joseph Scotcher, who is very flattering, he kind of allows his ego to be boosted by Scotcher because he still feels a bit raw after the events of the monogram murders. Um, but as a detective, he's slightly more on the ball. Then in The Mystery of Three Quarters, that's when he starts to kind of settle in a bit to his relationship with Poirot. And 
yeah, I would say you're right. Killings at Kingfisher Hill is the first book in which Catchpool has actually kind of sat back and thought, I'm quite enjoying working with Prowen. Like he's no longer phased at all by the fact that he's the junior partner. And even though there are things that make him uncomfortable, I mean, he has to, when he has to reveal that he's in charge of the investigation, he is a little bit annoyed with Poirot because Poirot's put him in a position where he's already met the people of Kingfisher Hill in a different context. And so he's like, thanks Poirot for making this a bit more difficult for me. But mm -hmm. he's much more relaxed and kind of, um, it's interesting actually, it's interesting you say that it's kind of lighter because it is lighter even though he does still find Poirot a challenge to work with, but it's almost like, it's almost like he's just welcomed and accepted the fact that Poirot is like this for as long as they're going to be working together. He's just going to have to put up with this. So yes, it can be annoying, but also by now he's very fond of Poirot and wouldn't be without him. There's a real um, growth, you know, or a progression, I suppose, in the relationship, which is also, I, I would say, I'm sure this is people could argue that argue at this point, but it's um, I think uh, uh, um, a difference from how Christie handles the Hastings Poirot relationship because I often find that in those the the later Hastings narrated Poirot novels, the you know they're still earlier on in the of overall, but when he's been working with him for a number of novels and he still doubts him and he still thinks, oh, this time Poirot's, you know, gone over the edge or he doesn't. I'm like, you idiot. <laughs> like, of course he hasn't. Stop. Like, haven't you learned anything? And this is the thing. This is the that. thing. Yeah. Like, and like, it, 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 yeah. No, she knows what she's doing, obviously, but um, you're doing something different, right? Where it's like, he actually, no, he is learning. He's like, I've, I've experienced what Poirot can do and I'm actually going to learn from him and kind of use that and, uh, you know, progress as a, a detective, which goes to Catherine's point that that is also, you know, that that is his job, right? That is what he's supposed to be doing or getting good at. It never is Hastings' job, actually. So perhaps that also is why Hastings, you know, never never really changes all that much on, on that score. But um, I'm also curious, I mean, you know, Christy had an infamously tortured relationship with Poirot, I still suspect that a lot of that was was done up a bit for uh, public relations purposes. Uh, but you know, I'm, every writer has a, a complicated relationship with uh, her creations, and I'm just curious. Now, you are the only other person who has published Poirot novels, multiple Poirot novels at this point. I'm curious if you, if that has given you any greater insight into her relationship with Poirot, or I'm also curious how you feel about Poirot now that you have published uh, these four Poirot novels. Do you, do you loathe that creepy little man? <laughs> she did. No. So I agree with you that I don't think she, I think she must have had a strong affection for him yeah. because I think when she expressed frustration with him, it's the kind of frustration you express for people you love not the kind of frustration you expect, express with people you really dislike. It's the, it's the sort of thing you might say about a very familiar family member. Like, oh, you know, they drive me mad. It's more like that. So I don't at all think she disliked Poirot. I simply don't believe she could have made him so, like, irresistible to millions of readers if she hadn't liked him. And I also think that possibly more than any other writer with Christy, you can tell how she's feeling about what she's writing. So one of the reasons I think The uh, Murder at the Vicarage is one of her best novels is that you can actually feel the tangible enjoyment that she had writing it in a way that, for example, when you read The Mystery of the Blue Train, you were like, oh, she was not happy when she wrote the book. And so you don't enjoy it as much. And her enjoyment of Poirot's character comes through. So I am choosing to think that she adored Poirot and that all was well. Um, I don't find him annoying at all. And even the things about him that annoy other people, I think are totally fair enough. So like his boasting, like he is cleverer than everyone. So I think it's fair enough. And his attention to detail and his OCD traits, I, I just love all of it. Um, 
I do think that partly insofar as she sort of was a little frustrated with him occasionally, it could have been something to do with the fact that when she created him, she only envisaged using him in one book. And then he became popular and she, and then he became massively popular. So I think because she was such an ambitious and intellectually curious writer, maybe in an ideal world, she would have liked her readers to say, write whatever kind of book you want and we will still buy it in equal numbers. And maybe because she felt a sense that her readers wanted more Poirot, more Poirot, more Poirot all the time, that maybe it was more a case of not she in an ideal world would have liked to write more different kinds of books. Because I think that would also explain why in the later Poirot novels, she doesn't have him there for the whole book. You know, she tries, she tries to have a bit of non-Poirot territory, even within a Poirot novel. Um, but yeah, no, I, I just completely love him. And yeah, I think he's great. I think he's, uh, I, you know, and I think it's also, it makes him more lovable when he is a bit annoying. There's a bit in, in Kingfisher Hill when he says something like, I can't actually remember what he says, but Catchpole replies, if only there was some way of knowing what that thing could be. And he's referring to something that Quara already knows, but is choosing not to tell him. <laughs> Catchpool says sort of affectionately, but sarcastically, if only there was some way we could discuss it with us both knowing what you're talking about, to kind of draw attention to the fact that Quara could just tell him, but is mm -hmm. choosing not to. Um, so, he, you know, even the things he does that might frustrate characters in the book, they are always at the service of enabling the reader to have even more fun. Yes. yes. I mean, I suppose if you were actually working with Faro and, you know, he was just having to save telling you whatever was in the letter and tell, you know, grand drawing room denouement, you would probably be a little irked as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. If I was working with Poirot, if I was actually his sidekick, me as I am now, every single time he said, I've worked it out, or, ah, yes, something's fallen into place, the next four would be me going around going, tell me, tell me, tell me, come on now, tell me. I'm not accepting you not telling me. <laughs> I would be very, I would be very um, dogmatic and pedantic in trying to get the information out of him. Uh, but Catchpole isn't. He just now accepts that Poirot is almost like a law unto himself and he'll be told when he's told. There's, I think it's in Mrs. McGinty's Dead and I'm forgetting the name of what I've begun referring to as the Inspector d'Histoire because unlike oh, yeah. the Touche series <laughs> where they just replaced those inspectors, <clears throat> with Jap every single time. There really are, uh, you know, quite, an, quite, quite a few, yeah. of yeah. single, you know, single book inspectors, but that inspector has a lot of personality. And I remember at one point, Poirot does exactly that. And he says something like, I'm going to brain you. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to hurt you right now. Just, ah! <laughs> <it's> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually, um, also want to go back to, we've been talking a bit about Killings of Kingfisher Hill, but I wanted to ask you a question specific to Closed Casket, which is the second novel. And I don't think, you know, we've spoken a number of times before, but I, I don't think that we've spoken on this, on this issue specifically. And it goes to um, the hook or kind of the, the underlying concept uh, in the novel. And I, we're not going to be able to speak 100% clearly about it because I really don't want to spoil the motivational hook the the motivation yeah. for the murder in closed casket because it is uh it's a whopper of a motivation i was blown away by it when when i got to the end I was like that is why the murder happened and i think it's brilliant and it's so brilliant that i suspect and i now have the author sitting in front of me so i can i can actually ask you i suspect that you had that idea for oh this is going to be this inc this crazy reason for you know for committing a murder and i'm going to put it in my book the only reason why i doubt that or why i want to ask you how that all came about and how it gelled together as a book is that you know one of the things i've been fascinated by in studying christie 
is as someone who had these gonzo hooks in her books, right? You know, we don't, we don't have to go through them all. We, everyone probably watching this interview has read most of those big gonzo titles like Murder on the Orient Express and, and then there were none. Um, she didn't actually start from hook all the time as much as you would think. You know, John Curran has chronicled in his Agatha Christie's Secret Notebooks, for example, that in Crooked House, yeah. He went through many iterations of who could have committed that murder before landing on who did. And I won't spoil uh -huh. Crooked House for anyone, but if you've read Crooked House, you'll know why that is so surprising yeah. that she but, not But know. What, about, what about Orient Express? Because I've always assumed that for that novel, she must have had the idea for the brilliant high concept bit and work backward from there, but I could be wrong about that. She, she must have, and I think she often did, uh, but right. you know, the fact that Crooked House, for example, was mo more organic, that, that it did not start there, really shocked me. And, and, and my guess is also that even if you do start there, these things, you know, there's a little bit of push and pull when you're actually creating a novel. And I, I'm just curious, given that you, you have, you know, one of, one of these books in particular, I think, you know, um, has that kind of gonzo hook and I felt the same way about it at the end. Um, I would just like to ask you, how, how did you come up with that? What was the process like? Okay, well, first of all, I'm delighted that you noticed and liked that element particularly because as a huge Agatha Christie fan, one of the things I particularly love about her books is when they have, I call it a kind of detachably brilliant concept mm -hmm. so she's written some brilliant books like say the hollow which is one of my favorites that's a brilliant book in fact it's my current favorite christie novel but i wouldn't say it has a detachably brilliant concept an element where if you said to somebody hey there's this murder mystery and it turns out that and just said the concept of the solution on its own people wouldn't go oh wow that's clever yeah now there are others like Orient Express and one of the murders, I think, in Three Act Tragedy. And even you could argue two of the murders in Three Act Tragedy, where you could just say to somebody, there's a murder and here's the thing. Say the concept and they go, oh, that's clever, even without knowing anything else about the story. So yeah. I love particular i think you've called them before the extra special christies yeah and maybe that's what you're now calling a gon i think that's what you're now calling a gonzo hook yeah sure. um, and i had never expected to be able to come up with anything like that because i thought well that's just what agatha christie can do and no one else uh, or almost no one else um and i'd written the monogram murders already and i thought i think it was like a detachable concept in that way that you could just say one line to people and they'd go wow and how that how so so first of all you're right to think that in closed casket that the i mean without spoiling anything we can say that the gonzo hook it's not really a hook but that the sort of high concept detachable element is the motive for murder yeah so i did come up with that before any other part of the novel Okay. It was absolutely the first inspiration. And the minute I thought of it and checked that no one had done it before, I was just like floating on a cloud of joy and ecstasy. Because I was like, this is, not only did I think this is such a brilliant concept, but I also thought, and I can't prove this, but I still think it, if Agatha had thought of this, she, she would have would totally it. have done it. Totally. totally. A million percent. Yeah. Okay. So now let me tell you how it came about. Now, pay attention, viewers, <laughs> because anyone who is particularly interested in the plot of Closed Casket, you will enjoy hearing this story. And I think I can tell it without spoiling the book in any way. Okay. I was having a discussion slash argument with my sister. And it was about, I wanted to know something about something that was going on in my life. Uh, not to do with me, to do with another person. I, wa I just wanted to know a thing. And I was moaning to my sister about the fact that I didn't know this thing I wanted to know. And my sister said, oh, come on, you do know. It's kind of like, let's say you've been for a job interview and the panel, you know, you haven't heard from the job interview people for a month after you've had the interview, right? And so 
in, that's kind of an analogy. So in that situation, if you imagine, I might say to my sister, I just want to know if I've got the job or if I haven't. And she might say, well, come on, you know, you've not heard from them for a month. You haven't got the job. Similar kind of, in terms of the relationship to the knowledge, similar situation. Yeah. She was like, oh my goodness, of course, you know, it's so obvious, you know. And I said, listen, let me tell you about my standards of knowledge. <laughs> I want to know for a hundred percent certain, and there's no way of me knowing for a hundred percent certain unless, and then I said a very colorful metaphor of what would be required in order to gain this hundred percent certain knowledge. And that metaphor, which unfortunately I can't reveal because it would spoil us something that gave me the idea because it was such an extreme and out there metaphor. I was like, oh, well, obviously it's extreme and it's out there, but what if somebody actually was willing to go quite far to get a certain amount of certainty? That was how it started. So midway through this conversation with my sister, I just froze and kind of went, oh, it's like that scene in North by Northwest, you know, where he goes, oh, and it turns out someone stabbed him in the back. He's looking at that photo and he goes, oh, and it's because he's had a knife in his back. It was literally like that. And I said to my sister, I can't carry on discussing this anymore. I've just had the most brilliant idea for a motive for murder. And that was how it happened. Did you like run to the computer or something? I, I ran to my handbag, got my phone out and uh, made a detailed set of notes. Yeah. But it was just amazing. And I just thought, Agatha would so use this idea. I I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, I do, I do. So, but that was that was an, an extreme. Speaking of satisfaction and certainty, Sophie, that was an extremely satisfying answer uh, for a reader to be able <laughs> to get from yeah. the author yeah. of the book that he has read. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and and also, I was quite like. When I, when I introduce closed casket at events and when I talk about it, I always say, you know, I had this idea and it was a motive for murder. And I also sometimes say, and it was the motive can be summed up in four words. It's that simple. But I also say no one would ever guess it mm -hmm. and nobody has ever guessed it. And that's another thing I love about it is that like when you know it, it's absolutely kind of almost obvious, but I don't think anyone would think about it because, and this is my favorite kind of misleading the reader. You know, crime writers mislead their readers all the time with red herrings and stuff, but the most elegant and satisfying misleading of readers is when you rely on readers' assumptions about life and the world to know that they will just mislead themselves. Mm -hmm. So the fact that nobody thinks of what the motive could be in closed casket isn't because I'm particularly hiding it or throwing red herrings in the way. It's because everyone assumes a certain structure of events, which if you assume that structure of events, you'd never guess the, the um, solution. It's also an, an obfuscation that's based on, ultimately based on character. I mean, it has to do with the character of the victim, the character of the murderer very much, as opposed to arcane knowledge, you know, about something or other. Like it's very much about the kind of people that the victim and the murderer are. And I find yeah. that extremely satisfying too. And I think those are some of the most satisfying Christie's when, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about this, when they're, um, uh, the, uh, an understanding of character is what gets you to the solution. And I think that also um, is what's happening in closed casket. So um, yeah. yeah, it's funny yeah. I, as, as we're talking about this, I, you know, I, it sounds as though I would say that that closed casket is my favorite among the four. Although I did really appreciate in this, this last novel and killings at Kingfisher Hill, again, the lightness, but not just as to, Catch Pool and Poirot, and I had to ask you, this won't spoil anything. Um, have you um, come up with a, a, a fully realized version of the board game Peepers? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I haven't. And I must admit that when I first started writing the novel, I did think that it might be quite nice if I could come up with a 
like an actual game of merchandising buy-in yeah (laughs) um but in the end i just thought no i'm not a board (laughs) game creator so i went the other way and i made it so that peepers is obviously such a complicated board game yeah you know every time pryo tries to get catchpool to learn the rules catchpool's just like no take them away and without spoiling anything there's a suggestion right at the end of the book that peepers really was too complicated and and you know not really um feasible in it in the form that that its creators currently had it in uh, so no, I didn't. I didn't work at all. You mean that most uh, people aren't going to appreciate seventy different rules in their board games? <laughs> I don't know actually, because I'm not a board game player. I'm more like catchable. I have a bit of an aversion to board games, but um, no. In the end, I thought it would be better to have peepers as just a sort of. It's like in a horror film when you see the monster, and it sometimes becomes a bit less scary. I decided Peepers was more effective if it was a board game that people could imagine rather than one that I knew the rules of, which also saved me a lot of work of actually figuring out all the rules to Peepers. Well, I also appreciated that um, there is sort of this backstory of some blood feud with the founders of Monopoly that, I mean, it's not spoiling anything, but I like that the thread through the novel is very funny. Excellent. Well, the Monopoly, when it first, or everything that's said in, in the novel about Monopoly is true. You know, there was somebody who claimed to have invented it and then somebody changed it and somebody else got cross because they said they'd invented it. So I wanted to sort of bring that in because all that was happening at the time that Peepers was being created. And I, I like the idea of the inventors of Peepers thinking, huh, those Monopoly people are never going to make it. They've got all these problems. Whereas we've got a clear chain of ownership and with obviously the reader knowing that Peepers is not a famous game in 2020, whereas Monopoly still is. Yeah, no, that it was, I, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I guess for, for people who haven't read the novel yet, like the last five minutes of conversation might not make sense, but I should have prefaced this by saying that yes, Peepers is a a board game that's a kind of running joke throughout the novel that is this would-be competitor to Monopoly. And I I like that analogy to a horror movie where you don't show the monster, but you do show the right flashes, Sophie, I think, which is what's so masterful about it, because one of the things that we know about Peepers, in addition to the fact that the game instructions are like 70 pages long, which is hysterically funny because we've all played board games like that, where we're like, what is happening? just stop. Um, there, the, the, the tokens or sort of pieces on the board are eyes, right? Like, aren't they? They're like little... Glass. They're round, round discs with eyes on them. <laughs> That's which, horrifying. And they're, and they're scattered all over this massive mansion. <laughs> So yeah, that's uh, in a house that's already not very relaxed and happy. That's an additional detail. <laughs> I can't even like you know those little plastic googly eyes that are often on children's toys and whatnot. I can't even handle them. They just creep me yeah. out. Anything yeah. having to do with false eyes yeah. <laughs> is just not so. The, the 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 mountains of just sort of these eyes scattered all over the place is is just. Uh, extremely amusing so yeah yeah excellent yeah it's interesting that you think kingfisher hill is the the sort of has a light tone because i mean i know what you mean but there is a way and i'm not going to say what because it would spoiler it but there is a way in which for me it's actually the darkest of the four um and which is partly why the board game motif reappearing right at the end is was partly to kind of i felt in a way the ending was like quite dark and i wanted to like end on a slightly less dark note so i think i think actually with all the books there's a light element and a dark element even monogram murders though possibly not as much but certainly the other three i think there's a mixture of of lightness and darkness I think that I think that's fair, and which there often is in Christie. I mean, that we talk about that all the time. That that's something she she managed to do. You know, she would build a coherent world and story in every in almost every novel, and have yeah. 
real elements of darkness and real elements of uh, yeah yeah coexist. I was also a little bit, you know, when we do our podcast and talk about novel rankings and whatnot, you know, we end up inevitably talking about um, running themes in the Christie novels. You know, we also like, you know, when we're going through our clues list, you know, if there's an actor in the novel, if there's questionable lighting, if there's a train, you know, like all of those are things that we always point out because like, if you see any of those, yeah, you know that they're there. And it struck me when I was reading um, Kingfisher that you have um, a number of like the classics in this. Do I? No. Tell me, because I may not have done it deliberately. My well, brain. That's, that's, going, that's what I was going to ask. Is yeah, it, go on. it was deliberate? I mean, we have a train with a timing clue. Hold on, just let me. A train? Well, or a bus. I'm sorry, it's a, it's the bus. Oh, but hang on, that's not a train. I went to great lengths to come up with a no, different no, no, mode of transport. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was deliberate. That but, was but, deliberate. But, yeah. So my my. Grave apologies. No, but the, the, the bus um, it still has the same sort of um, series of stops clue. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, that was deliberate. Yeah. Yeah, and we have um, we sort of have the misidentifying um, deliberate misidentification, which is a little bit also the costuming clue, which comes up tragically much later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, I'm trying to think, oh, um, there's a disfigurement yeah. that is a very favorite Christie, um, gruesome <laughs> Christie theme, but um, yeah. you know, that plays into this too. And I just like, I wondered how much you were conscious of those um, as sort of things that run through really most of her canon because I just I just noticed them particularly when I was reading this and I thought it was fun. Yeah so those things that you've mentioned I was aware of and um, and probably other things as well so I do what happens is it's not that I think which Christie novel shall I echo what happens is I'm putting together my story for each book and when I come up with something that is an echo of something from Christie, then I usually notice it sort of afterwards. Oh, I almost forgot my favorite one also, the real estate clue. Christie loves her real estate clues. Yes, yes, that's true, yeah. Um, yeah, so actually that one I hadn't thought of, but the other ones I had thought of, the sort of similarity. And then I guess I also thought that one of the characters in the novel is a similar, although they don't play a similar structural role, they're a similar kind of character to a character, a main character in Lord Edgware Dies. I don't know whether, I don't know whether that's too veiled for you to get it, but there's a character in Lord Edgware Dies who is very conscious of what they're doing and like, sort of almost like confidently nefarious. And I'd say there's one character in Kingfisher Hill who's not necessarily guilty of anything, but has a similar kind of, I guess, like panache about, you know, arranging, a like trying to control a set of circumstances, maybe. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about, and I do know what you're talking about. And no, that makes, that makes quite a bit of sense. Yeah. And also, I guess, the... Um, you know, Christie wrote brilliantly in Appointment with Death about a family where outsiders are kind of looking at the family going, well, why on earth would they all behave like that? It's, it doesn't make sense. Why don't they all behave more normally? I think the central family in Kingfisher, uh, the Devonport family, have a kind of very warped internal logic, which when you first hear about the way they carry on, you're like, what? that's weird that's dysfunctional but when Poirot and Catchpool go to the house and spend a bit of time with those family members they see that this family is just kind of so locked into its dysfunctional behavior that all this weird stuff is normal 
for the members of that family. Yeah. Right. No, Which and that's so the crooked house too. Yeah. Yeah. Cro crooked house, appointment with death, Hercule Poirot's Christmas, after the funeral. After the funeral, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she does it. She she does do it a number of times. Who doesn't yeah. love a you know a story about a dysfunctional family? That's exactly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the basis of so many a great story. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, speaking of all these titles, I mean, we've asked you this, you know, multiple times before, Sophie, but part of your answer has always been that um, the answer always changes. So what is your favorite Christie novel today? Oh, I think today it's The Hollow again. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it tends to veer back and forth between The Hollow and Murder on the Orient Express, which I get fonder of every time I reread it. Um, and then I've just written a piece actually about my top 10 underrated Christie's, Ooh. which is very different from my top 10 Christie's. Sure. But for example, in my top 10 underrated Christie's, and I would never say this is one of the best or one of my all time favorites, but I recently reread The Big Four thinking, oh, well, I won't enjoy this much because everyone thinks it's one of the worst. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's just a very different kind of proposition, but for what it is, I really loved it. And I in particular love the relationship between Poirot and Hastings in it. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just, Catherine is, might disappear from screen in a second because it, the big four is her nemesis, but I'm I, I, now that I have the strength of Sophie by my side here, I'm going to admit I don't hate the big four either. No, well, I just, you see, I think we've talked about this before when I was on the podcast, but if I, if I were ranking the books, I mean, there's, there's one yardstick which counts for me more than anything else, and that is how much am I having a great time while I'm reading it? So The Mystery of the Blue Train, I found a real slog. I was not enjoying the process of reading that book at all. And I've reread it a couple of times and I just can't seem to enjoy reading it. And I didn't particularly enjoy rereading, you know, Poston of Fate, for example, which isn't one of Agatha's strongest. And I know, you know, I would never say that the big four is classic Christie, but the level of enjoyment I got from it was immense. And so that was very influential in my uh, opinion of it. Even though it is absurd. It is absurd, but it manages to keep its absurdity. It, it's kind of pitched in a different way from all the others. And the absurdity is consistent within that, that fictional universe of that novel. And so there's no elements which are jarring. I mean, one of the other books that I chose for my top 10 underrated Christie's was Murder in Mesopotamia, which has one element that is... Absurd. In, it, it, <laughs> implausible. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to be convinced if I'm wrong, but at the moment I would say it's implausible. But everything else about that book is in a different register of realism and proper sophisticated Christie. And so there's a kind of jarringness between the general tone and that one implausible element. Um, but I still put it in my top 10 underrated because I still think it's one of her best in every way apart from that one element. Literally mm -hmm. in every other way. I think if that, if that one element, it, it wouldn't even have had to be removed if it had been tweaked slightly to make that one element more plausible, then I think loads of people would list that among her best ever novels. Um, so yeah. that's, that's in there in a different way on my list of underrated, because I say just because there's this one flaw doesn't mean the rest of it isn't totally superb. But I think the big four, it's just within that world that the novel creates, the absurdity doesn't feel absurd. You do kind of buy into it, or at least I did, Mm -hmm. So I wasn't constantly finding that my reading experience was interrupted by me thinking, oh, come on. I just bought into it all, which I think is testament to the strength of, you know, what, you know the success with which she pulled off that very different kind of Poirot yarn. What do you think, Catherine? 
I understand the point being made. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that I can be sold on the big four, um, but you know, I maybe I will revisit it down the road and look at it through that lens, and perhaps I will have a very different reading experience. So you know, it's entirely possible. Right after you reread The Secret of Chimneys, you'll reread The Big Four, right? I mean, you know what? The Secret of Chimneys might secretly be great, Humper. <laughs> I Well, let me ask you both whether you were sufficiently surprised by all the outcomes in Kingfisher Hill. Did, you didn't guess anything in advance or there was nothing where you went, oh yeah, I knew that all along. I did well, you know. Catherine and I are um, are are sort of on either end of the spectrum as to mystery readers because um, I am actually a much less active mystery reader than Catherine is. Ka um, I'll, I'll I'll let Catherine speak to how she reads, but um, I am really not actively trying to solve. I'm not not trying to solve when I read, but I yeah. really enjoy just being taken along for the ride and then reflecting on the solution after the fact. So I did not guess, but I, that is why I, I'm saying that with the caveat. Yeah. That I yeah. Don't guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, as Kemper knows, and which irritates a lot of people, um, including my own family, I'm like famous at being the guesser. Like I'm just like a spoil sport because I'll do it with television shows or movies. I'll be like, oh, wow, well, I know what, like, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> and everybody else is like, what's wrong with you? Don't do that. It's like, you're spoiling everything. And it won't be something that I know. It's just, you know, I just, I, I, I want to figure out the puzzles, Sophie. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, no, I did not, um, I didn't, um, I did not guess the ending at Kingfisher. There's one element of it that I picked up on earlier, but I don't think I put all the pieces together. So yeah, I was, I was surprised by the outcome. There was only sort of one bit of it that I sort of guessed at. Yeah. Um, Being aware of the things I'm doing that are echoes of things Christy did, I think I also tend to be aware of the things I am doing that she didn't do. Cause like, I always like to think, is this something that has been in a Christie brand novel before or is it not? Um, and I think the, oh, it's so hard to talk about it without spoilering. There's a particular aspect of, there's a character, there's lots of characters in the book who are not entirely honest, but there's a particular piece of dishonesty which, uh, which is a big and important part of what I like about the story. And I think it isn't a kind of dishonesty that Christie wrote about. So that was quite exciting because I like to have a mixture of the old and the new, you know. Well, um, I, I sort of wondered, I mean, the, one of the primary characters almost does fit better into a psychological thriller. Like you could see a sort of different version of what the actual murder mystery is in this where that character I mean would be the main character in a psychological thriller about yeah. a deeply yeah. damaged individual yeah exactly exactly yeah I think that's what I'm talking about so so that character enabled me to do something structurally in relation to motives for murder again my favorite thing motives for murder that character enabled me to do something structurally that i that added a, a good dimension i think to the story uh, and i and i so the challenge for me was doing that in a way that was very psychologically driven and and psychologically quite like shocking and devastating but also worked on the level of appearance and reality being very different within a traditional detective novel. Right. Yeah, I mean, and that's an interesting um, segue at some level um, into sort of talking about how you balance the writing of a Sophie Hanna book, like a contemporary, largely psychological thrillers, I would say, crime fiction. Um, 
and then making the switch over to, you know, the late 1920s, uh, 30s, Poirot novels, and sort of how do you, how do you switch between the mindsets? Um, it, it's just, it's not really switching, it's just, I think my, my imagination knows that if it's writing a Poirot novel, then that's going to, at least on the surface and tonally, feel very different from one of my contemporary novels. But I still have the same range of preoccupations and obsessions and interests, and I still have a crime writing brain that was shaped by reading Agatha Christie at a very young age. And the combination of those two things produces the exact books that I write. I mean, Closed Casket as well is kind of, the, the motive for murder that we've talked about works very much as a golden age, clever plot element, but the psychological um, content of that book, you know, really it's a story about a very determined and obsessive older woman who's madly in love with, although she doesn't put it like that, but she is nevertheless madly in love with a very strange chap who behaves in a range of strange ways. Now, one of the reasons I loved writing that book was precisely because the, the sort of psychological weirdness could absolutely be contemporary, but I was able to do it in the structure of a 1930 detective novel. And actually in the 1930s, I'm assuming people were as weird as they are now in their behavior patterns and obsessions. So, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure even when Christie was writing in her classic golden age period, there were people all over the place behaving in a psychologically strange and interesting way. And she writes about those people and she writes about them using the vehicle of conventional detective fiction. But there are a lot of psychological um, intricacies and there's a lot of psychological depth in her characters. Like when the vicar's wife in Murder at the Vicarage says, I could have married any number of suitors who would have been delighted to have me as a wife but I wanted to marry you because I knew you'd be ashamed of me, but couldn't resist me. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, so all well, of that. The, Griselda, one of the best characters in. Yeah. I love her. I, yeah. and I love her. <laughs> yeah. She's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, is, I have to ask, I mean, is there going to be a Poirot number five? Are you, are you working on the next one? Um, I'm not at the moment working on another one, but you know, my attitude is I, you know, when I took Poirot on, although it was only initially for one book, I vowed to myself in that moment that I would be available to him for as long as he had use for me. So if he calls on me, then yes, uh, I'm very happy to, to give him another outing, but nothing has been officially announced or anything yet. And I'm certainly not, um, working on on it right now gotcha. i'm working right now on one of my other series my contemporary crime novels simon and charlie my my contemporary detectives from the culver valley they are going to be having another outing soon lovely very exciting when are you guys going to subject my four books to your rankings process <laughs> well, i want to know <laughs> I am, I am big and brave enough to take it, you know, even if I, even if I got a big four level rating, I'd still find it fascinating. You want to know the plot credibility and, uh, you know. I think about these things all the time. You know, when I was editing King for Jail, I was like, what would Catherine and Kemper say about plot credibility and plot <laughs> mechanics? I love that. <laughs> well, that's about as big of a compliment as we can receive, so... <laughs> I mean, I, I do. Have to, I do have to say, I really want to know what the plot of Midnight Gathering is. <laughs> yes. Well, it's about a dysfunctional family. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the author's only real choice of topic to write on. <laughs> yeah. There could be, you know, there there could there there could be this whole sort of like cottage industry of like side sort of you know tangential creations within your Poirot continuation novels. Peepers, the board game. Midnight yeah. Gathering. Um, I don't know if you heard about this too, but there apparently is a television series now in production 
that is, um, uh, and I believe that it is a Swedish television production of the Finnish detective created by Ariadne Oliver within the Christie novel, Sven Hirsen. You know how yeah. that is her creation? There's now a yeah. TV series that is going to feature him as a detective. Right, I heard something about that years ago and I didn't, then I didn't hear anything else. So I didn't know whether that was happening or not, but that will be interesting. That will, will be very interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, the, the Swedes doing the, you know, a Finn, or maybe he's going to become Swedish. I'm not, I wasn't clear on what was happening there, but. Um, very odd. Um, there, uh, somebody, somebody reached out to us, I think on Twitter, and um, asked why there wasn't um, a sort of real life version of Mr. Satterthwaite's um, guide to all of his friend houses. <laughs> <laughs> because you know it comes up routinely that he at one point published a coffee table book of all of these sort of glamorous yeah. states that he goes to and I was like yeah again another like I would probably pick up a Mr. Satterthwaite uh you yeah. know yeah, home definitely. <laughs> and the Ray Raymond West's novels I mean um, I want to you know yeah at least skim a Raymond West novel it, I, I, I might not be able to make my way through the entire thing but <laughs> yeah, yeah, and all of and all of Ariadne Oliver's novels. Somebody oh, could those, write them. You know, the the I'm still I need to, I, I'm very hopeful that this this the series will will at long last produce uh, the second goldfish that was yeah. one of Ariadne Oliver's novels. What is the deal with that second goldfish? I've been wondering for ages. So yeah, yeah, all my questions will will be answered. Well, I, I maybe this is a an, an appropriate final question, Sophie. But um, I'm curious because I have to imagine that as an as an author of, of many novels before coming to to Poirot, you interacted a ton with readers and whatnot. But I also have to imagine that you're interacting a lot with Christie fans who have come to your novels and that that must be very interesting. And I, you know, as as an, an avid Christie fan myself, I know that we all get very passionate and intense about these things. And um I'm I'm curious how that's been, you know, in interacting with the fans. You must have a lot of opinions. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been really amazing. And and you know, the volume of emails that I get via my website has gone up and up and up, which has kind of surprised me because the monogram murders was the first one and the one that was a big news story. And probably, in fact, in terms of like global sales, probably the one that sold most copies because it was such a big news story. But what I found is that as I write each new one, the volume of emails I get from people saying they love the series and please can I carry on writing them is going up and up. Um, so yeah. I'm already getting like a seriously large amount of emails from people who have somehow already read Kingfisher Hill, I think maybe via NetGalley. Oh. or I don't know whether Goodreads, somehow people are reading it and um, loads of people are writing to say it's their very favourite one, which is always lovely. Um, and before that, lots of people wrote to say Mystery of Three Quarters. I mean, I'm interested because I'm a bit of a sort of geeky statistics person. I am always interested to know which ones people like best and why. And my strong impression now this is not a scientific study by any stretch because this is just based on the communications i get but my strong impression is that the people who contact me like um the mystery of three quarters best and think it's the best one um and kingfisher hill isn't out yet so i can't really see if it's going to be a, a trend but certainly i've had more emails from people saying it's their favorite and the best since I finished it than I did for any of the others at an equivalent stage. So I think that's quite interesting that they, to me, they seem to be being thought of as better and better as I go along. Cause I think a lot of people thought closed casket was better than the monogram murder, but that I find that really fascinating. And it's, I think especially because given that closed casket is the one with the high concept detachable, like really clever standout element, 
I guess I would have expected that that would be most people's favourite, and it doesn't seem to be, which is interesting to well, me. Anyway. I, I do think the mystery of three quarters has the the opening with this 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 very sort of mysterious and peculiar phenomenon, right, of of these people getting a letter supposedly from Hercule Poirot accusing them of of murder it is very Christie-ish. And, and, yeah. and yeah. arresting. It's arresting in that Christie-ish opening hook kind of a way. Um, yeah. So it doesn't surprise me that a lot of people r respond to that one. Have you yeah. found that more people are reaching out to you in the past few months? Because we were discussing this um, with some other people recently and also um, have had some outreach from booksellers, etc. Um, and librarians saying that they can't keep um, Chrissy novels on the bookshelves during the, yeah, you know, lockdown of it all. That it seems to be uh, like a craze for people trapped in their houses just ordering. Oh, that's interesting. Novels, and so I sort of wondered. You know, obviously we are doing this on Zoom. I you know all of us would rather be in Turkey, um, <laughs> but. Um, you know, I just wondered if you were getting more of um, sort of outreach from people because it seems like this is the time where, you know. Yeah, adding... possibly. I mean, I, what I notice is just that the volume of communications I get from people who love the books has just gone steadily up since I started writing the series. Um, and it just seems to get more and more. I mean, I guess it's because the more books there are in the series, the more opportunities people have to discover them and then they read all of them. And then, you know, people like that sort of collector approach, don't they? Where they find one book in a series, then they read all the others. Uh, so it could be that as well, yeah. I know, it's, it's, the, it's the hardest thing about finding something that you really like and then like burning through them in you yeah. know month and then realizing that you, run out because you didn't pace yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you know, I haven't had that feeling about a new series for such a long time. I have it on Netflix, but in terms of like finding a writer and thinking I must read everything they've written, um, I haven't had that feeling for a long time. I still have it about Agatha. I still think I must reread everything she's written, even though I've read it all five times. No. I mean, they're always worth picking up. Again, I think that obviously the three of us are, you know, yeah. obviously going to say that. But, you know, it's certainly, I always, um, I always find it worthwhile. Um, yeah. Especially given that we're all burning through all the content in the world, right? I think I've, I think I've run out of Netflix. <laughs> oh, have you watched, have you watched, oh, it's not on Netflix, it's on Amazon. But still, have you watched Billions? with Damian Lewis and Maggie Siff. I have, I'm more of a succession person. Um, I, I, like, somebody I know says that there are two groups, of, there are two groups, there are the billions people and the succession people. Um, oh, fall into the succession camp, but um, no, billions is great. Never yeah. showed the time. <laughs> I, I, I love succession as well, um, but billions is my current addiction in terms of TV drama. Mm -hmm. You have you have room in your heart for both. That's always my answer when people say, "Well, you know, are you a New York person or an LA person?" I'm like, I have room in my heart for both cities. I love them both. Well, are you, are you a Paro person or a Marvel person? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and I no. definitely have room in my heart for both of them. Absolutely. <laughs> I just um, yeah. We always thought it was funny that, especially when we first started the podcast, like people for some reason thought I disliked Miss Marvel. And I love Miss Marvel. <laughs> I adore Miss Marvel. You can just appreciate things in different ways, though, also. Totally, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I, as a reader, I do love Marvel and Poirot probably equally, but obviously now I have a special loyalty to Poirot. Yes, and, and I believe it was the, because that original concept, I remember asking you this in a previous conversation, that original concept lent itself to Poirot in Monterey yeah. Murders, which is yeah. why kind of went in that direction but again you know meant to be because it, it could have gone in in a marpelian direction and then that would be something else entirely but um yeah it could and i think it's interesting because if i were writing a marple novel i'm not sure that i would the marple novels are different 
So I think if I were to write a Marvel novel, I would have to get into a slightly different mindset again. Mm -hmm. um, but as I've always said, I feel that um, Poirot would not like it if I were to write Marvel. I think I should stick to Poirot and do justice to him. <laughs> um, I think he uh, is probably nothing but a bit jealous as a person, so I can't imagine that he would like attention taken away from him. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, maybe what we should really end on is, because this was supposed to be the 100th anniversary, well, it is the 100th anniversary of Styles. I mean, maybe we should just end a little bit talking about that first book. You know, that is Poirot's entry into the world. It's the entry of Christy Dobbles into the world. And I mean, I think it's weird that it's sort of the one that we've barely touched upon in this conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Styles is an amazing novel. It's an amazing debut for Poirot. Uh, for me, when I think about it, it's one of the Christy novels that remains in my memory most vividly between readings of it, I can really vividly picture so many of the characters, the floor plan of the house and where everyone's bedrooms are and where the doors are. And I remember you know, every time I read it, I spend ages working out the logistics of the locked and unlocked doors. Um, so I love it. I do think it's a contender. It, it wouldn't be in my personal top 10, but I do think it has a claim to being one of her best novels. Um, I like the little brief legal foray towards the end of it. It sort of briefly becomes a kind of courtroom thing and then it comes out of the courtroom. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's brilliant. I think the solution is really clever. The, there's a proper sort of menacing air when you realise what's going on and who's behind it. Uh, so yeah, I think it's brilliant. The only thing about it that slightly jars for me is that there's a very clever aspect to the mechanics of the murder plot when you realize what's what's been plotted there's some there's some specialist knowledge and cleverness there which is super impressive and it's it's one of the best things about the book but it invo it for me as someone who has an aversion to a particular kind of subject matter. I think, yeah, I think you've talked about in the podcast the what the murder method is, right? No, of course. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so in order to explain how the how the um, the poison is given to the victim, mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of sort of sciency terminology. Yes. And. Um, I'm just someone who, if, if, if anyone says a scientific term to me, I'm like, Ugh! run away from anything that might have been in a chemistry lesson in school. It's a little bit, you know, she, she rarely does the specialist knowledge Yeah. after. Um, I think that it doesn't really come up very much after that. And for good reason. I mean, I certainly don't like that um, in a mystery novel necessarily. But I think, it's I think it was... It was very impressive. Well, no, but I was going to say, I think, like, if it's your first novel, you want to um, add something of yourself to it. And that was her specialty, right? She yeah, gave a little bit of her, you know, own knowledge into that and clearly wanted to write about the science of it. Absolutely. And it was brilliantly clever. And it's just a my personal taste thing. Like, there are some things which, if they crop up in books, and it is entirely my prejudice... But if they crop up in books, I'm just like, oh, I don't like that thing. Like spaceships, <laughs> hobbits. <laughs> spaceships and hobbits are two of the, the main ones. Um, dragons, you know, that kind of thing. But anything that makes me feel as though I could be in a chemistry lesson at high school, I'm not massively keen on. So, it, so there was like maybe one paragraph where I felt as though I was in a chemistry lesson. But other than that, I think it is. it was very much... A favorite. It's like she's establishing her bona fides almost yeah. as, as a first time author and, and saying, well, this is where I have expertise. And I believe that one of the reviews of the novel, you know, was from a chemist or, or someone, you know, medical that said, you know, 
the, Christy really knows her stuff and, and yeah. she thinks that. But then I think she, she and, and it's funny because it, I think that's, isn't that one of the, the, the basic rules, those, those SS Van Dyne rules is that the solution cannot hinge on expert uh, knowledge. So with her very first novel, she's sort of playing fast and loose with those rules. And I kind of love that because it works yeah. anyway. And then she oh, does. Yeah, no, actually, I think she, she, I'd be on her side against that, against Van Dyne, because when she explains it, you are able to think, oh, that's so clever. Yeah. And there yeah. are enough other clues that you can get. So I think that all works really well. It's a bit like, for me, it's just a bit like Cards on the Table, which many people think is one of her best mysteries. But because I have a slight aversion to the concept of bridge as a game, I've no idea why. I'm just like, hmm, bridge, card games. Um, but, weirdly, <laughs> but weirdly, I don't have an aversion to the mention of board games, even though I do have an aversion to playing them. So, like, it's all just a personal taste thing, really. Well, you know what, uh, Sophie, I look forward to uh, Poirot book number five, hinging on a group of people playing peepers in a room <laughs> and you know, one of, one of them getting murdered. And then we did, we need to know the ins and outs of peepers. So we all have to buy peepers and play it a number I'm, of times. I'm going to spoil something for everybody. If it is at all like Monopoly, it's always the banker. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very meta, wouldn't it? To have a uh, number five with them all playing peepers. Um, but yeah, I, and the the, uh, the other thing just to be said about the expert knowledge thing on Christie, because even though she pulled back, I think, from peppering all of her novels with extreme expert knowledge when it came to poisons, that is obviously a running theme through Christie, right? She favored poisons as, yeah. you know, her um, means of, of murder. And um, I just mentioned this in our last podcast episode, but I'm, go I'm going to brag yet again because I have another opportunity, but I'm just so proud of myself that I was, was reading uh, the last short story we covered was one of the labors of Hercules. It was the, um, the Cretan bull. And yeah. Poirot asks in the story a throwaway question of, does anyone in this, uh, in this house have heart problems? And I literally wrote in the margins, atropine. <laughs> Because at this point, I am a trained Agatha Christie yeah. specialist, and I know heart problems, atropine. And how was the person in that in that uh, that novel? Not in that short story, not killed, but uh, you know what was the, yeah. the the means of of trying to do away with him? Atropine. So we well done. Read enough Christie, you too uh, shall become an expert in poison. For anybody, for anybody that thinks he is lying about bragging about this, um, <laughs> I will be the first to say that I have now heard this multiple times. So he really is clearly proud of himself. Both, both off and on screen, as it were. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. No, that's well spotted. You see, I, I still wouldn't be able to. When there's something in an Agatha plot that relates to poison, because I'm so unscientific, I can only retain it in my mind for as long as I need to remember it for the plot. But like, if you said to me now, how, what effect does strychnine have? What effect does cyanide have? I would not be able to tell you. I just don't retain that kind of uh, knowledge. Right. Whereas I remember every detail about the sort of emotional m makeup of all Christie characters. No, absolutely, absolutely, and I still say I think those are the, the those are the kinds of clues and obfuscations that are the most satisfying. That are kind of character, yeah, emotion based because we all yeah. share, I think, that interest, right? Yeah, and, and that sort yeah. of thing as readers. So, yeah, brilliant. This was a delight, as always. I mean, we we could talk to you for hours upon hours upon hours, and and at this point, we have actually, if if we kind of yeah uh combined our our many conversations but um I'm, we're so happy that we got the chance to talk to you uh, over video this time we've upgraded yeah. to video hopefully we'll be able to do something in real life perhaps at the agatha christie festival in 2021 i hope so that would be amazing so, thank you so much sophie we really appreciate uh your time thank you for the the poirot novels and um we hope that there are more to come you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been really lovely to chat to you again. Bye. Thank you so much, Sophie.